stand here, let's sing together. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way. We have found a refuge only you can say. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and
John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Amen. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Amen. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord, we confess that your love out endures the saints and angels' songs. It preceded us. You are the Alpha and Omega when it comes to love, the beginning and the end. You have shown us love supremely. Yes, by creating us, but by sending your son to die for us to propitiate your holy and just wrath on sin and then raising him from the grave that we might have justification. And Lord, that's why we gather tonight is to celebrate that love, to celebrate that gospel. Father, we pray that you would tune our hearts to sing your praise this evening in a manner that is consistent, comports with your glory. Father, we pray that your spirit would give us eyes to behold your glory tonight in the face of your son. We need that tonight, Lord. Hallowed be your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
you stand with us as they make their way down? We have a great high priest whose name is love. Before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for Good evening. If you will turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 18, we're going to be looking starting in verse 16 to the end of the chapter. Thank you, Adam. Praise team. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for this remarkable youth choir that continues to bless us each week. And we're grateful for you, grateful for the parents. It's a form of discipleship because those songs they're singing, if they don't yet believe them, it's going to be hard for them not to believe them after singing them week in and week out uh, because God has just hardwired our hearts for, for song. And, and so it, it is beautiful. And for those youth who do already believe these words, it's only going to confirm them in their faith. And as 
two, as a, a parent, and Heather and I are parents, and now of two in college, uh, we're just very aware of how fast those young days go by. We only have a short period of time to disciple them in our homes. We need to be availing them to all the, the, the ordinary means of grace that we can. Well, if you'll pray with me, we're going to get into this passage and ask the Lord to continue to, to bless what he has already blessed tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. We thank you that we have a great high priest who has gone before us, uh, who has sprinkled the altar with his blood to make us fit to come into your presence, and one who ever lives to make intercession for us in our weakness. And Lord, we even see those realities in a topological way tonight. And we just pray that you would give us eyes to see that and behold that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the headline news on Friday evening was this. Possible plea deal could remove death penalty in the 9-11 case. As ABC News reported, plea agreements under consideration may mean that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, I think I pronounced it right, maybe not, the suspected architect of the 9-11 attacks and his fellow defendants never face the death penalty. Of course, it was Mohammed who presented the idea to al-Qaeda leader um, Osama bin Laden uh, of flying passenger planes into buildings filled with passengers. Of course, Osama bin Laden signed off on that and gave him the go-ahead to, to plan the 9-11 attack, so Muhammad was behind all that, and now he may get off. One of the reasons for that is that there are legal disp disputes over the fact that there may have been some intense interrogation uh, by the CIA on Muhammad and his cohorts. I, I saw in one interview several family members of victims of 9-11 who were lamenting, who were angry, who were grieving that not only has justice not been served, that it potentially may not be served. As one of the, the fellows on this news report I saw, Peter Brady, whose father was killed at 9-11, said, it's about holding people responsible, and they're taking that away with this plea. And that's why divine justice is so hopeful. It's why divine judgment is so hopeful. The wrath of God, God's holy wrath, really is the hope of the world. There is so much injustice, we see it every day. Injustice in this world, but remember, as we saw last week with a, with God speaking to Sarah, God will have the last word. He always has the last word. Psalm 37 promises the wicked will be cut off. That's a definitive statement. Well, as we come to our passage at this point, the meal is over. And Abraham has become the only mortal to ever dine with God prior to the incarnation. It's a remarkable privilege he has. And over that meal, Abraham heard God uh, say to Sarah, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And so that was a, basically a renewal of the covenant. But the Lord was not there just to reveal these things to Abraham and Sarah, their future that is. He was also bringing Abraham into the deliberations concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was after all a prophet. And as we see throughout the Old Testament, the Lord regularly informs his prophets. He announces his plans in advance to his prophets. So for instance, Amos 3 verse 7, for the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. God wants the people for the rest of history to know 
that when judgment falls, it was not just a natural calamity. So in this particular case, when, when judgment falls on Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not just a people who experienced a bad deal from living in a fallen world, like what's happening in Maui. This is actually a unilateral divine judgment that is falling on Sodom and Gomorrah. And that would serve all generations to show that every tribe and tongue is subject to this God. Not just Israel. All the nations are accountable to him because he created them, okay? And that brings us to the first part of this passage. We see in the first five or six verses the judge of the nations. Look with me in verse 16. And then the men set out from there. Who are the men? Uh, They are the two angels that were with Adonai. And they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? So Abraham does not have the slightest clue of what's coming here. And the Lord here proceeds to give his reasons why Abraham must be informed about this coming judgment. Verse 18. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So we don't need to get the idea here as we read this passage that Abraham's spirit is more generous than God's spirit. God is going to prompt Abraham to engage in prayer. God doesn't need our prayers, but he has ordained that our prayers play a role in his kingdom purposes, a significant role in his purposes. And so Abraham's intercession that we're going to see here tonight is just a reflection of God's heart who takes no pleasure in the judgment of the wicked. In fact, we know from Isaiah chapter 28 verse 21 that judgment is God's strange work. Isn't that interesting? Isaiah calls it his strange work. It's a necessary work given the fact that we now live in a fallen world, but he did not create the world for judgment to fall prior to the fall. So this is a strange work. But interesting, this is the first time this this phrase, all the nations, is used in Scripture. In fact... Uh, the, the term or the, the Greek phrase, if this were the Greek translation, is pantata ethne. It's the same exact phrase that you read in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, Go into all the world and make disciples, go into all the nations. Pantata ethne. Well, this is the first time that this phrase is found. It's preparing us, isn't it? It's preparing us for, for God's burden, God's plan to save the nations. And so you see it here with with Abraham. Um, Those who are in Abraham must have the same burden for the nations that Abraham is to have. Of course, we know as history unfolds, there's only one who does. And that is the seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ. But look in verse 19. He says, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Of course, it's, it's the obedience of faith. It's not earning or meriting favor. So that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. As we saw this morning, God delights, he takes pleasure in the obedience of his people. 
And we see this here. But I want you to note the order in which God does things. First, he is the Alpha and the Omega. So here, it begins with God. I have chosen him. This, this is sovereign grace. God has chosen Abraham. And he chose him not because Abraham merited that. It was all of grace. But notice, after grace, there follows obedience through which this grace reaches its goal. Verse 19 is very important in understanding that. Moreover, he is saved not just for his benefit. Sometimes I'm afraid, and I don't think it's, I don't think this is epidemic at Lakeview. Praise God. We have so many people here who are zealous for the nations. They're zealous for their neighbors. They, they, they evangelize where they go. You hear, I hear it all the time. Sometimes I get convicted that there, there, are two, there are so many people in, in, at Lakeview who are more zealous for evangelism than even me. And, I, and I'm the pastor, and so I, I, I'm grateful for you. And, but I think in too many churches that we, we see salvation merely as what God has done to benefit me. But notice, Abraham was chosen to bless the nations. And, and this begins with this inner intermediary step of, of creating a righteous people whose conduct would be a light to the nations, which we'll read about in Exodus chapter 19. Now, notably, again, Genesis is a book of first. This is the first text in the Bible, not the last, where you see the father's responsibility in being the spiritual leader of their homes. Notice again in verse 19, he says, command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. This is the first of many. Again, this is in the context of judgment. And so God has raised up the, the father to play a instrumental role in guarding their children and preparing their children uh, for that great day of judgment. And it's here that Sodom and Gomorrah provide the stark contrast to what Abraham was to be and what his family was to be. Notice in verse 20. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave. I want you to know that word great. It's the same word that was used in Genesis 6, 5 before the flood, before the judgment of the flood to refer to the greatness of the sin of humankind. Moses, who writes this, is connecting the account of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, the sinfulness of those before the, the flood. And I find this terrifying um, because God is very aware. He's very aware of their sin. And, and, and we live in a day where it seems everything has been turned upside down. I mean, we, we have moralized abortion. Abortion is prior, perhaps the most wicked thing uh, in the history of the world. And we've called it choice. All right. Uh, we have, we have moralized abortion. We have redefined marriage and that's just the beginning of the kind of wickedness that we see in our culture. And God is very aware just as he here is very aware of the sin. Peter attests to that in second Peter two, verse six, by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, extinction, making them an example of what was going to happen to the ungodly. So Peter gives us an inspired uh, account on why this passage is important and chapter 19 is important to us. This is just an example of what's going to happen in the day of judgment. Well, notice in verse 21... I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me 
And if not, I will know. This is called an anthropomorphism. God is attributing human-like qualities or actions to God for the benefit of the reader. God does not literally have to go down. Uh, he is omniscient. He sees all things. Scripture teaches us that. But this is, this is just giving us um, a view of, of the reality of what God sees and what, and what concerns and what breaks his heart. Uh, he goes down. But more importantly, again, Moses is connecting this account, this time not with Noah and the flood, he did that earlier, but with Babel. Because what do we see at the Tower of Babel? It says the Lord came down to see. And he said, let us go down. And so Moses is linking the judgments about to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah with the judgment that fell at, with Noah and the judgment that fell at the Tower of Babel. And here's why this is important. When we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, we tend to think of mere, we, we tend to think of only sexual sins. And certainly, the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. And let me just define what sexual morality is. It's not just homosexuality, all right? Uh, we, we tend to focus on that sometimes in a world where it's, it's, it's pushed uh, on us. Sexual morality is any, any sexual expression expressed out the covenant of marriage. Let me repeat that. Sexual immorality is any sexual expression outside the covenant of marriage. So if it's premarital sex, if it's pornography, okay, if it's adultery, if it's anything like that expressed outside of marriage, of course, pornography, even expressed in marriage, is a sin. But any sexual expression outside of covenant marriage is sexually immoral. And, and the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. Certainly, sexual immorality was a problem in Sodom and Gomorrah, but it wasn't just that. So, for instance, in the day of Noah, it certainly wasn't just sexual immorality. Listen to how... Matthew describes that day in the day of Noah when judgment came. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They're just doing life. But they're doing it without God. That, that, that's the inference here. Until that day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware. They were oblivious that judgment was about to fall until the flood came and swept them all away. And again, Moses is linking this account with Sodom and Gomorrah with that account. But listen to what Ezekiel says about Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, sexual morality was a problem, but it wasn't the only problem. Here's what Ezekiel tells us in Ezekiel 16. Speaking of Sodom, she and her daughters had pride. Pride. Unrepentant pride was worthy of judgment. Excess of food. And prosperous ease. They had lost their dependency on God. Prosperity had become a masking agent. But she did not aid the poor and the needy. Biblical injustice was one of the reasons that judgment fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course, he's not talking about the poor and the needy who could actually work. He's talking about those who couldn't do anything for themselves. Paul indicts caring for those and giving handouts to those who can work. But to those who can't. There was injustice communicated. That was Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't think it's just sexual morality. It's that, but it's a whole lot more. So we've seen the judge of the nations. That brings us to the second part of this passage, the mediator of the nations. God is preparing us for one even greater. Look with me in verse 22. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. I love that. 
Man, could that be said of us? Brian still stood before the Lord. I, I hope that is a pattern in my life that could be said of me. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So earlier, Abraham had, had stepped in the ga- uh, gap for, for a lot when he saved him from those four, those four kings, right? And now he's praying Yes, for Lot. He's got Lot on his mind. But he's also praying for all of Sodom. That's remarkable to me. This is the Abrahamic covenant taking effect. Through you, all the nations will be blessed. Abraham has bought that program. He has believed that gospel. He now recognizes that he is the mediator. He is the intercessor. He is the means by which blessing would come to the nations. Through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. Now, humanly speaking, this makes no sense. That Abraham, being a Hebrew, would care anything about the people of Sodom. It makes no sense on paper. We got a lot of missionaries in our midst tonight. Praise God for you. From a human perspective, it would make no sense that you would give your life away for people that you didn't know until you went. It's the same thing we see here. It's the same heart that's developing here. Why? Because the gospel has captured Abraham's heart. And he is jealous for this nation, Sodom and Gomorrah, and certainly for his his nephew. And this scene has all the earmarks of a, of a courtroom drama. It's one of the most important, remarkable examples of intercessory prayer in scripture. In fact, it's the first example of intercessory prayer in the scripture. And and Abraham is resting his argument here upon the, the twin pillars of divine justice and divine mercy. He says, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Abraham's at a a moral impasse. And, And here's what it is. If the cities are destroyed and the innocent are destroyed with the cities, then God's justice is impugned. Because the innocent are destroyed with the wicked. But if God doesn't bring judgment to the wicked, his his justice is also impugned. And so what he does here is he appeals to God's mercy. And of course we recognize as Revelation unfolds, mercy is not amnesty. Where God impugns his justice. Mercy comes to us because God absorbs the debt, all right? And that's the mercy he's appealing to, whether he recognizes how that's going to play out in history. And so he, he, he prays for the sake of the righteous. Verse 24, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it? For the 50 righteous who are in it, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. And I love this verse, or this part of this verse. Shall not the judge of all the earth Do what is just. This is one of the most comforting texts for me in all of Scripture with regard to judgment and the justice of God. You you think about eternal hell, and we recognize the Bible clearly teaches that hell is eternal, and it's an eternal conscious suffering. 
And, and we recognize as well that much of the world has never heard the gospel. And they'll be held accountable, not for not hearing the gospel, but for what God has revealed to them. But what I find comforting here is, in the day of judgment, there will be no victims. There will be no victims, just culprits. And it's because of truths like what we read here. The judge of the earth will do right. There will be no one in that day who will be able to say, you, you didn't give me enough revelation. I didn't know enough. I did, enough was not revealed to me. If I had only known. And this is the first time and the only time this term for God is used. Again, Genesis is the book of first. Now, this is, in this particular case, it's the only place where we read he is the judge of all the earth. But it's true. Every nation and tongue will be held accountable and they will be under this judge in the the day of judgment. That's why we do missions. It's also why we do evangelism because your neighbor will also be held accountable. It's also why we, we, we speak that gospel in our homes because our children and our grandchildren will stand before the judge of the earth as well. But as Robert Canlis writes, Abraham knows God as the just God and the Savior. And on that twofold knowledge of God, he builds his argument. I love that. He knows him as just and he knows him as Savior. Now, the question that, that's the tension that will develop in the Old Testament that can only be resolved by the cross. How can God be both just and the justifier? All right? I'm not saying Abraham fully understands that. He understands the gospel up to this point, what God has revealed to him up to this point. But we know it will require a substitute. It will require a savior for that tension to be resolved. Well, notice in verse 26. And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Let me just say this real quickly. This is speculation, but I believe one of the reasons the hammer hasn't fallen on us yet is because there's still a church here in the United States. And not only that, and that's why we have to pray for our churches One of the many reasons we need to be praying for our churches. But not only that, there's a church that's, even though not every church is serious about this, there are churches like Lakeview that are, we're serious about the Great Commission. I believe that's the reason the hammer hasn't fallen full throttle yet. But you see this here. If I find Sodom 50 righteous, I will spare the whole place. Abraham answered And said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. What does that remind you of? That's humankind created, right? From the dust in chapter 2, verse 7. He's essentially saying, I am coming to you not based on my merits. I'm just dust and ashes. I'm, I'm coming based on your character as God based on your merits, not my merits. But I want you to note as well, though this prayer could be read in just a couple of minutes, shorter than that, just a few few seconds for that matter, the way it's written, the the way uh, Moses lays this out, it appears that this is a long, persistent prayer on the part of Abraham. He is persisting with God. In fact, he's going to intercede six times for for Sodom. Notice in verse 28. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. And then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry 
and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way. And when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. We can only speculate at why Abraham stopped at 10. I've consulted commentaries. I've looked into this. And at the end of the day, we can only speculate It may be, and this is what Ken Matthews says in his commentary. It may be that Abraham has learned that the number is unimportant because God is merciful and he will in the end discriminate between the wicked and the righteous. Maybe that's what Abraham learns through that intercessory uh, prayer. But let me close here with some some applications, some principles from this, this passage. First of all, there's no, there's no order of importance here. This text teaches us that fathers are to take the spiritual lead in the discipleship of their homes. Mothers play a critical role. Of course they do. They play a very important and vital role. But here we see even the first place where fathers are called to pass their their gospel to the next generation. It's in the context of coming judgment. And the reason I say that is because the stakes are high. The stakes are high. They're so high. And that needs to sober us. It it really does need to sober us. I, I feel like sometimes we spend way too much time pursuing other matters when we need to place this as our first priority as fathers. Second, here in this passage, we have one of the great examples of intercessory prayer. Now, I want you to keep in mind, did Abraham believe in the sovereignty of God? Yes, he did, even over salvation. After all, he was a fruit of the sovereignty of God. And yet he prays, and he prays, and he prays. You know that scripture gives at least 190 exhortations or commands to pray. We don't understand that mysterious relationship. We just know this. God is sovereign and he answers our prayers. Draw near to me, he says, and ask. Third, this passage sets up a principle that salvation will only come through the mediation of Abraham and his offspring. This, this is established here. It's not established in John 14, 6. Of course, John 14, 6 is important. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the offspring of Abraham, par excellence. But it didn't just begin with Jesus. It begins here. We see here through the covenant made with Abraham that salvation will be found only through Abraham's offspring. Fourth, Abraham here is an example that shows the kind of heart we need to develop for the nations. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah They have been bad for his nephew. We're going to see that in chapter 19. Sodom and Gomorrah has been a terrible influence on his his nephew. It would have been easy for Abraham to hate Sodom and Gomorrah. But because of that gospel promise made to him that through him the nations would be blessed, it had changed his disposition towards these people to mercy. To love. 
And not just the nations, all the unrepentant. All the unrepentant. We run into them every day. Let's pray, Lord, give me an opportunity to this week to present the gospel to someone who needs Jesus. Fifth, the judgment that falls on Sodom and Gomorrah. And again, this is chapter 19. Peter tells us it anticipates the judgment that will fall on all those who are outside of the seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because will not the judge of the earth do right? And if he doesn't judge sin, he's not doing right. He has to judge sin because he does right. This is the judge that all of us will stand before on the judgment day. And there will be no way, zero way, to survive the scrutiny unless God makes a provision for that judgment. And that's the final point. God has provided one, and he's better than Abraham. He's better than Abraham. He's better than Moses, who also interceded in Exodus 32. He's better than Amos, who interceded in Amos chapter 7. In chapter 19, we're going to see that God remembered Abraham. That's chapter 19, verse 29, just a page over. And set Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So Lot was saved because God remembered Abraham. Abraham being the intercessor, the mediator. But understand, Abraham, as great an intercessor as he was, could only intercede. The one who would come from Abraham would not only intercede, in fact, the intercession would only come after he had made atonement for people like the Sodomites and the people of Gomorrah, the nations. He would take the judgment they deserve. He would satisfy God's wrath on their sin. And then he would be raised. He would ascend to the Father and now he ever lives to make intercession for us. This is what Abraham is teaching us tonight. It's a word for believers, but it's also a word for those of you who do not have the Son of God as your mediator tonight. As Adam and the musicians come forward, don't leave here without doing business with that mediator. Here we see that God saves Lot only because of Abraham. And Abraham was a pale shadow of the one who would come. But the Lord Jesus Christ has come and he has been crushed for you. He's been crushed for our sin. And then he, he lived to tell about it. He was raised from the grave. And all you have to do is humble yourself and Come to him in repentance and faith. And the Bible says, you will be saved, your sins will be forgiven. And now you'll have a mediator forever. One who will ever live to make intercession for you. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing? Thanks for worshiping with us today. If you felt the Lord leading you to respond today, whether that was to receive Christ for the first time, or to take your next step in baptism, or if you have a prayer request, we want to start that conversation with you. Visit lakeviewbaptist.org slash contact to get in touch with one of our pastors. And as always, you can stay connected with us through our social media and website.